Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ultimate Guitar interview with the great Corey Wong, who looks like he's at home in a studio. We caught <laughs> you at home. Yeah, I just moved recently, and uh, what you're seeing is me unpacking enough to be able to record and do my job, and then just living in this because I, I can work and I need to get it sorted. So sorry that you have to see this mess. <laughs> Where'd you move to? Are you still in Minnesota? Yeah, I'm still in the Minneapolis area, Twin Cities area. All I right. Just, I'm about I got a, I got a bigger house. Needed a little more room. Good deal. Are you going to build your own studio there? Is that where you do a lot of your recording? I have a little studio space a couple miles from where I live. If I need to do like a actual full-on studio session with my band, we go elsewhere. There's a nice big studio in Minneapolis that I use, but... This space, I'm going to have it as a little rehearsal production suite. I'm going to build it out, do a little bit of action in here, and it'll be good. I know we have a lot to talk about today, but I always like to start at the beginning of yeah. the story. So um, I know you started on out on bass, but I always yep. like to ask, what was your first guitar, and what were some of the first songs you tried to learn? My very first guitar, I bought at a pawn shop. Now, I, I, I need to get one of these. I need to find one of these somewhere. I swear, I've i seen them on Reverb and whatever, but it was this old Traveling Wilburys Gretsch guitar. That was my first ever guitar. And um, I bought it at a pawn shop for like $35, right? This thing, it, it's a decent guitar. Honestly, it's a great Gretsch, but this particular one was not cared for and it was it sucked. But <clears throat> it was enough for me to get moving. And then eventually I bought... Uh, a light, a blue Stratocaster, which a lot of people have have known me to play for you know my entire career. But um, yes, the first songs that I learned, "Come as You Are" by Nirvana, da 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 uh, when I Come Around by Green Day, Welcome to Paradise by Green Day, I learned, um, yeah, I, I've, a lot of a lot of Green Day songs, a lot of Blink-182 songs, a lot of Nirvana. The very first guitar tab book I bought was Rage Against the Machine, Evil Empire. Okay, oh, mind you, this is me with my traveling Wilburys Gretsch plugged directly into like a 110 crate amp. So I'm reading the tabs and I'm playing along with the record. And I'm like, I swear I'm doing this right, but it sounds nothing like the album. <laughs> like, oh, I don't have pedals. Oh, I can't get this sound unless I, you know, whatever. So I was pissed at guitar tabs for a while. Cause it's like, this sucks. I don't sound like Tom Morello. But then I realized, oh, there's like all this other stuff involved. Um, so then I bought a I bought the Green Day Dookie tab book and then I bought the Red Hot Chili Peppers Blood Sugar Sex Magic bass tabs book and guitar tabs book and I learned on both instruments top to bottom. I learned note for note. I would play through the entire record on bass, then I'd play down the album on guitar. Next day I'd do the same thing, same thing until I could mas that until I mastered it. And um yeah, that just kind of relentless practicing was was such a huge thing and and you know learning guitar tabs off the internet that was i mean when i was growing up playing it was kind of still early guitar tab websites and um you know there was varying degrees of good ones and bad ones and you know now we have great ones so uh it's it's it was a, a wonderful way to learn guitar as a as a kid to kind of be self-taught i'll shamelessly ask uh have you ever used ultimate guitar to look up tabs Absolutely. Absolutely. I've used ultimate guitar since I was a kid. I mean, even some days now, like, okay, I'm a professional musician, right? I got good ears, uh, but also I don't have a ton of time. So sometimes I'm playing through something and I'll learn it and I'll learn it. I'm spending 30 minutes really going through something like, ah, what? There's one spot that's weird. Why is that weird? What is that? And I'll quick go to ultimate guitar. I'll go to ultimate tabs and be like, oh, okay. That's what it, I'll find the five star version and you know and and just fine it's like oh really that's an a flat okay cool yeah and then and you know because somebody else put in the the, the four or five hours to learn it where i'm like i want to learn this in 20 minutes and you know i'll 
I'll get there in 17 minutes, aside from a few notes, depending on the song. Most of the time I can just hear it and get it, but certain songs like, I don't, there's one little passage that's weird. What's going on there? What's the twist and turn? It's nice to be able to have sites, you know, even as a professional musician now to go back and use it. Yeah. And you went to school at McNally, you uh, learn music theory. So it, it's cool to hear that even after learning music theory, tabs are still useful. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, man. Tabs have gone up and down as far as being en vogue or being taboo as something, but like, if I'm going to be honest, tabs are what got me going. That was the catalyst to help me really figure stuff out. It's a much easier way. I mean, there, there's limitations to tab. If you don't see the, the rhythmic notation, that's the one hesitation with tabs is that a lot of times it's hard to get rhythmic notation. Of course, a lot of magazines have figured that out now, but, um, with sheet music, it's like the the open the high open E string. There's several ways. You could play that six different, depending on how many frets you have. You could play that note. If you see it on standard notation, there's six ways to play that note on the guitar. You know, five very easy ways to play that note on the guitar. So, you know, depending on what you're playing, like it's just like, ah, I could play it down here. I could play it up here. But with tabs, it just makes it very clear it's like this is what it is and there's less thinking involved and we all as reading guitar players know there's it's hard it's a hard instrument to read on and you know it's there's a reason why saxophone players are better at reading it's like there's one c sharp okay maybe there's some false fingerings but you can assume that all of it is the exact like you're playing this note and that's where it goes you know, so guitar is hard and that's why tabs are, are great is because it, it's just going to tell you exactly where it is. So judging by the, the first songs that you learned, uh, it seems like you started off in the punk and grunge and where most of us started, the music that was popular back in that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. What facilitated your move out of that box into things like jazz and funk and kind of the more experimental styles? My dad's a huge jazz fan. And when I was growing up, there was jazz around in the house all the time. And it wasn't just classic bebop, jazz, that sort of thing. My dad was heavy into Jaco Pastorius, Weather Report, Mahavishnu Orchestra, all these different, you know, as far as guitar players go, John Abercrombie, Ralph Towner, Schofield, Pat Martino, obviously Matheny and those sort of things. But it's like, you know, most kids growing up didn't listen to Ralph Towner playing guitar, you know? Or, or even Schofield, for that matter. You know, it's like you kind of had to have a certain type of parent or surrounding to be interested in that sort of thing or, or be exposed to that. Um, so I, I that stuff was around the house. And I, you know, the records were in the house. The CDs were in the house when I was growing up. So I would listen to that sort of stuff, uh, you know, with varying degrees of interest. I was always in, into Jocko and Weather Report. That stuff always was great to me. Schofield was great because of the grooves and that. Certain stuff, it took me a little longer to come around to, but I did always appreciate it. Then eventually, yeah, I mean, really getting to the, the kind of lineage to being really deep in it was the punk rock stuff, the Chili Peppers, Jamiroquai. Oh, wow, this is opening up something new. That first Maroon 5 record. Oh, wow, this is opening something new for me. Dave Matthews and John Mayer kind of introducing me to like the sort of jam thing. And then... Uh, getting into certain bands that are kind of in the jam world, but also like good songs, you know, some, some jam groups that I don't love the songs, but I like the music, you know, but uh, it felt like mayor and actually even early Maroon five. I mean, I, I saw Maroon five in 2005 or something. And they would, they did like the Dave Matthews thing where they play a song and then it was just soloing for like six minutes after the song was over. It was dope. These guys were shredding, you know, and um, I still like them now. I mean, as far as pop music goes, but um, it, it was just a different thing. So that kind of exposed me to like, oh, this kind of jamming world and then getting more interested in the other guitar players that are doing that. You got Schofield with the Uber Jam Project. And then Schofield kind of draws people. He's a good gateway into more of the jazz thing. Bill Frizzell, Pat Metheny, those sort of things drew me in. Eventually got deep into jazz, wanted to be jazz guy for a while. And, you know, then just have kind of gone all over the place with it. For a lot of us that 
that learn to play in our bedrooms or our home studios. And we re really never played with other people or bands or in a jam format. What are some essential things that kids out there should learn uh, in order to be able to be successful in a jam sort of an environment playing with other people? I think the number one thing is listening. A lot of folks that I see at jam sessions are there to play the thing that they've been working on or, oh, check out this thing that I can do. I want you all to see this thing that I can do. And I get that temptation. I've been there. I've been there. I still have that sometimes. If, I'm, if I've been working super hard at playing some thing, shedding something, you better believe I'm going to try to put it into my solos or something. But it has to be for a musical purpose. And the thing that I see at jam sessions, a lot of people go in there just wanting to play the thing that they've been working on. The most important thing is be a part, be present in the moment. Your thing that you've been working on might not fit over the thing that you're playing on right now. Try to acknowledge that. Listen, be aware of your surroundings. When is it your turn to say something? When is it your turn to contribute to the conversation? And when is it your turn to just lay in the cut and chill and just be in the thing? And the majority of the time, you're, you're meant to just kind of, hang in the thing. And I think a lot of people um, lose sight of that. And they'll, they'll just like want to play all over everything. It's like, oh, here's my chance. And then they, they do it. So listen, be present in the moment, be aware of your surroundings and respond to those. But so many people just get tunnel visioned going into jam sessions. Oh, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I came to do. I'm going to seek and destroy. It's like, What's the point? It's just, it's no longer uh, fun for people. It's just like, oh, you came to show off. What's the point? Do, do that on, do that on your Instagram page. Like that's fine. Cause that's just you, you know, but we're here together. This is a, this is an interactive experience. And if people want to see that, uh, see a group of musicians jam very, very well, they should go see you live. Uh, they should go to <laughs> Bonnaroo super jam, uh, yes. which is happening in what a month or so. How did that come together? Bonnaroo Super Jam is happening in the middle of the month here. <coughs> I think on the 17th. Yeah, that was, I mean, so at Bonnaroo, uh, my band Corey Wong is playing and other band Wolfpack is playing. And they always do a Super Jam every year at Bonnaroo. It's the kind of the most legendary Super Jam where they get, you know, it's Herbie Hancock has done it, Thundercat, you know, all, they, they have a lot of people who, there's a great lineage of people who have hosted the Super Jam and put together sets for it. So they asked me to put together a set of music, a bunch of guests. It's going to be amazing. I've got everybody from Remy Wolf, uh, Victor Wooten, guys in Wolfpack. So, I mean, just tons. I, I don't even want to list them because I'm going to forget one person and feel bad about it later. But um, it's just an insane. And some special guests that have not been announced that are going to blow people's minds. It's it's one of those things where I've, I've got a, a list of tunes here. It's like a funk jam and I've got open sections for, for just in the moment things to happen. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. But they, they asked me, they knew I was going to be there with my thing and with Wolfpack. So they said, will you host this? I said, absolutely. So I'm stoked. It's going to be really fun. What sort of things have you learned from Wolfpack and, and working with them and, um, how have they impacted your career in terms of uh, the, your style and your technique? You know, Jack absorbed me to being in the band maybe six years ago, became part of the band. And, you know, through that, I was, when I had joined the band, I was really kind of searching for my voice, for my thing on the guitar. And I think being a part of that band has really helped me find my voice, find something unique that I do and find a lane for myself in not even just on guitar, but in music. And that's something that was really great. And, and, uh, you know, a lot of what I was playing before was with different artists that were, that were single track minded or just into their own thing. But with Wolfpack Jack has really tried to um, curate a band and a community of people where we can help each other find our thing and, through that band, you know, the encouragement and just like the conversations and the, the, the seeking of self 
has really helped me to find who I am as a as an individual on my instrument and as a musician and just those conversations, music business, production, all this stuff. It's like we're always it's just a constant think tank with that band. We're always trying to trying to contribute something clever and interesting to the conversation, trying to, you know, not one up each other, but to help elevate each other. So it's been it's been really fun. And I recently uh, watched a documentary about your recent tour where you went out with your 12 man band and it, it yeah. led me to it's super fun videos as always. You, your production's always really fun and really great. So I'd encourage anybody to watch those videos. But uh, it did lead me to thinking, do you have some advice for making touring viable in this day and age uh, for a band that big? Um, guys going out there and doing it themselves with the big production like you did. You know, we hear a lot of bands talking about how difficult it is to make money touring. Yeah. Um, did you find that to be a struggle and how did you overcome that? It is hard a at any level. It can be it can be difficult. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say that with a little bit of a caveat. I always want to put on the best show that I can, given the resources that I have. When I first started touring, I wanted to have this exact thing that I have now. I couldn't afford it. So at first it was, all right, we're going to go out as a four piece band and we're going to do the thing and we're going to do our best. And we're going to have a fun, entertaining show as a four piece band. We can all fit in one car and drive around and do this thing. It's minimal amount of gear. Then it was, all right, now we're fitting in a minivan. We can fit six of us in there. And, you know, I would do all the extra jobs, tour manager, driver, blah, blah, blah. You know, I was handling all of that. And, you know, then eventually grew a little bit more. Okay, now we're now we fit in kind of like a sprinter size van, have a little trailer, that sort of thing. And, and you, I eventually was able to make it grow where it's like, oh, yeah, we have two cars now that we're driving around. The horn section in one car, everybody else in the other. And it's one of those things where I've just had to had to grow it piece by piece as it's gone. This last year is the first time that I brought out full production. Normally, it's just you use the house rig and make it work. This for, this tour is the first one. It's finally like, okay, I get to bring out a lighting designer, a stage tech, and we have all that extra stuff. Bring out the full horn section. It's been really fun. And it's one of those things that touring is hard to make profitable but you have to just make be willing to to do many jobs yourself to until you can get there i'm going to make sure that they feel good get a good rate and and that everybody feels great about it you're a busy guy you've already got some releases in 2023 you got a single coming out today which when this runs uh will have been in the past yeah uh, but uh you got a new record coming out. What what does 2023 have in store for you? I have a new album coming out and I'm really excited about it. some great collaborations and guitar playing wise. I feel like I've stepped into some different realms on this album that I haven't in the past. A lot. I mean, most people know me as consummate rhythm guitar player and that's what I am. I'm, I'm a rhythm guy. I love that role. But on this album, I play more guitar solos than any of my other albums. And I have a few solos on this record that I think are probably my best solos I've ever recorded, which obviously that feels really good. And a couple of them being just improvised in the studio solos, which to me are always the best ones that I, that I come up with. They're just in the moment feeling the thing. A um, bunch of festivals this summer, going to Europe, going to Asia, going to Hawaii, doing a, a residency in Hawaii. And then um, I'm doing a Europe tour in October, which will be, fantastic yeah a lot of a lot of really great stuff coming up and the band is sounding as tight as ever best the band's ever sounded so it's um it's really fun Wolfpack has a handful of shows and a residency in new york later this year fearless flyers have a couple festivals and a new york residency in december so it's it's good really good and you have a signature strat which uh i yes! i'm a huge i'm a huge uh fender guy uh and so I was really excited to learn when your strap was coming out that you changed body dimensions, headstock dimensions. You did a lot of really subtle tweaks, kind of similar to what they did with the Silver Sky. So I I was not what what yeah, uh, yeah. PRS did with the Silver Sky. Um, we could talk about that. Yeah. I've... 
how do you feel about the Silver Sky specifically? I think the skill, Silver Sky is dope. I mean, I'm a Fender guy through and through, but you got to give it up. That Silver Sky is dope. And speaking, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that because when I put my Strat out, one of the first industry cats to, to message me about it was John Mayer. He goes, dude, how did you get Fender to do this? I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, man, back when I was in Fender, and it's a different team of people at Fender now. So maybe, and maybe this is why there's a different team of people. I can't speak to it. I love the cats that I'm working with at Fender. Fender is an amazing crew, amazing team. But he said to me, like, look, man, I wanted to make a lot of these adjust, these exact things that you're talking about. I wanted to do stuff like this, really subtle changes, but I kind of wasn't allowed to at the time. The company wasn't doing that sort of thing at the time. How did you get them to do it? Uh, Cause like I, I wanted to make a lot of these things and now I just did it over at PRS with the silver sky, which turned out to be great. It's exactly what he wants out of a guitar. I got exactly what I wanted out of the guitar. And I just told him, I was like, I, I said that these are the things that I want. And I talked to them about it. They probably learned their lesson maybe from like mayor asking for these things. And you know, whoever was working at the time, you know, if they didn't, if they weren't open to it, you know, I, I understand why why John maybe was upset or or I don't know. I, I can't I can't speak to any of that. But um what I can say is Niall Rogers and I both had a hunch about a a just a little bit a little bit thinner body size doing something for the way that the attack of the guitar happens. And they sent Niall uh, a copy of his Hitmaker, his famous Hitmaker guitar. And he was like, it doesn't do the same thing. It's a little bit thicker than my guitar. And they're like, wait, what? No, we did it. We specced it to the exact year of yours. And he brought his guitar in. They're like, oh my gosh, like this one is, just got sanded down a little more or something, you know, because they're, you know, hand sanded and like whoever was doing it just like stayed on the instrument for 15 minutes longer than normal or something. So I was like, I'm not the only one. I'm not nuts about this. So Niall and I were both telling Fender the exact same thing. And Fender's like, okay, we'll do it. Like if you, if Corey and Niall, the two rhythm cats are saying that this is a thing that they're looking for out of a guitar to give like the rhythm guitar thing, there's gotta be something to it. And then we did the guitar and Fender was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is great. Yeah, it's exciting moving forward, knowing that they're willing to make those changes and willing to work with artists and have an artist-driven design process is really yeah. cool. So from your standpoint, I know uh, an instrument's a very subjective thing and, and we all have a relationship with a certain instrument. It, it would be naive to think that the design they had in 1954 is the perfect design. So if there are some design flaws from that 1954 Stratocaster, what would some <laughs> of those be? And maybe they're evident in the design of your your signature instrument. I mean, flaws, that's such a, a subjective thing, you know, like, look, Fender has changed a lot about the Strat over the years. That's That's the reality of it, too. It's like, come on, guys, it's not... It's not like you've never changed it. I mean, look at the 70s headstock versus the 60s headstock. Take a look at, you know, the guitars that were made in the 80s. Take a look at the made in Japan ones from the 90s, which are incredible guitars. And, you know, there's all these different iterations of the Strat. Some of the curves being a little bit different on the headstock. Some of the fonts being a little different. Some of the curves of the body being a little bit different. Or, you know, the contours of the body. I think... What helped me find some of the things that were um, much more user friendly now is like the the way that the the butt of the guitar when your when your hand goes all the way up the neck it's more of a contoured thing now rather than just squared off it's just much easier to fit your hand in there to reach the higher frets on my guitar. And the, the curvature of my, the contour of my guitar, it just sits much easier in the body, the contour of the neck and the, 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 uh, the contoured radius of the fretboard helps it to stay in tune better than the original design. So the intonation of the guitar that the way that I have it now is much better. The, the tuners that I'm using that I put on my signature Strat hold the guitar in tune much better. The shape of the neck, to me, it, that's a personal preference thing. 
course. So, but for me, it's a little easier to get around. It's a faster neck than a lot of other strats that I've played. So those are some of the things, the features that I wanted to put on my signature strat that it's like, these, these are functional reasons why I want it to be this way. I can play faster. I can play more clean and effortless and it sits more comfortably in my body to play it for hours on end. Now, because you're from Minnesota and I'm from Minnesota, uh, I feel like we're obligated to address the, uh, have you ever jammed with Prince? Did you ever meet Prince? I know you have a lot of people in your band who did play with Prince. The majority of my band is Prince alumni. And some of us, my, my friends and I that are my generation, we grew up playing under these guys. Prince would come out and see us play. So had this weekly gig and Prince came out a handful of times. And the first time that I met Prince in person, he came out to this club bunkers and we, I was playing. And um, this is after, after I had kind of discovered my voice a little bit, I had been playing with Wolfpack for a little while and been exploring the sound of, of kind of what, people know as the Corey Wong thing, quote unquote. Now I kind of had a handle on it. It was like the, the first phase of, of having that sort of sound and feel identity. And, um, after the set, one of like one of his handlers, one of his bodyguards came up and was like, Hey, uh, Prince wants to say hi. So, um, I came up and I was like, Hey man, nice to meet you. And he, in the, in the way that Prince does said that, you know, you've got an amazing sound. You've got a unique sound. It's incredible. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're an incredible guitar player, but you, you have a sound, you have a thing and it's incredible. And that to me, anytime I'm really feeling down <laughs> now, I just kind of think back to that. It's like, you know what? Prince gave me that seal of approval for my thing. And, you know, that's, one of the things that we as guitar players struggle so much to do is find a unique sound and a unique thing. Some of us might find it, but also is it something that is also magnetic and that people like, you know, and for, for me to be doing something that's in the funk realm and to have Prince say that it's unique and cool and incredible, I'll carry that with me to the end. <laughs> So I really appreciate you taking so much time to chat with us today. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. We we have a lot of kids who come to the site looking up tabs, uh, as as maybe you did when you were uh, yeah. learning to play. Uh, do you have any advice to that kid? Or if you could travel back in time and give yourself advice uh, from back in the day, if you could hop in a time machine and give uh, young Corey Wong some advice. When you're learning songs... Don't just stop at the notes and rhythms. Don't just stop at, oh, this is some sort of overdriven sound, tone. Try to dive deep into the nuances. Try to dive deep into the things that really make something musical. There's a difference between being able to play the notes and rhythms and really being able to play music. You can teach a, pl you can teach a machine to play the exact notes and rhythms, but what makes something connect and what makes something unique and human is all those little nuances that get put into it. Think about the releases of the notes. When does somebody release the notes? How are they attacking the notes? What kind are, is it all downstrokes? Is it alternate picking? Get into the, all those details. And those details, when you dive into the details, it's really going to help you understand the guitar part in a deeper way. It's going to help you understand the approach of this guitar player in a specific way. And then don't stop there at just learning the guitar parts and the nuances of the guitar parts. Think about how it relates to the chords that are being played. Think about how it relates to the melodies. Don't just learn the guitar parts to learn the guitar parts. Is this guitar part just uh, these two notes or is it kind of outlining a C minor chord? Try to figure that out. Figure out how the parts relate to the music that's happening and the context around it. And that way it'll help you not only understand the part itself better, but it will help you to understand how to create great guitar parts when it comes time for you to do so. Excellent advice. Yeah. Um, 
thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being such an inspirational guitar player. Uh, every time I listen to one of your one of your songs, I always like to uh, uh, find the nearest guitar and try to uh, play different rhythms and stuff. It's it's really cool. So uh, thank you for being so inspiring. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having and me. Thank, and thank you for adjusting the strat uh, and and adding some of those <laughs> nuances that a lot of us have been wanting for a long time.